anyone who writes loves to read. And uh, as long as I can remember going to the first the National Festival down in the mall and then now to the Gaithersburg Festival, it's great. It's a smorgasbord for people who love to read. And I think it's been great over the years, the way it's grown. Uh, I, I've seen each year the things that they've added, and this year looks like it's going to be the best one ever. And it is a great honor for me to uh, introduce my drama teacher, Mr. Tom Bogar. Now, um, just to give you an idea of this, uh, when you're a first year drama student, there is a lot you have to learn. And a lot of those skills that I learned, of course, I've used in my political career and in other places. And a lot of it has stuck with me for, well, most of it has stuck with me for my life since then. And uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting about acting and drama is uh, a lesson that I learned from uh, Mr. Uh, you know, it's funny, I have to call him Mr. Bogar because that's what I always called Mr. Bogar. Uh, Tom Bogar, uh, of course, taught us some very basic skills, like if you want to describe something to somebody, literally create a picture in your mind and then as if it were a photograph and then j just describe the photograph and it's a more vivid and effective way of describing to people what you want to communicate and it's a technique that I've used um, on the floor of the house, I've used it in speeches, it works, visualize. But another thing that uh, I learned from uh, Mr. Bogar was this whole notion of how actors do their craft, what it is that is unique about uh, them and especially unique about successful actors. He told us that uh, really the best actors are the ones who take a character and find an angle, a twist that nobody ever really thought of. Now, it's all about perspective, and ironically, the uh, drama club at Paint Branch High School wasn't the drama club of Paint Branch High School. The name of it was Perspective and I was a member for one year of Perspective. And that is really what I learned from him, and I've used it in my career, and I've used it in all sorts of aspects of life. So much depends upon your perspective. So why are we here? We're here because, you know, it's true, millions of actors have played Hamlet and Lady Macbeth, but the unique ones have a different perspective. Well. All of us have heard about the assassination of our 16th president. We have seen things on the History Channel. We've probably seen movies about it. But nobody has ever looked at it from the perspective of the actors and the stagehands. And there's, there's a section in the book very early on where he <clears throat> asks you to visualize this. Imagine if the President of the United States, and the President today is Barack Obama, imagine if the President of the United States were murdered in your workplace by your favorite colleague. That's what happened at Ford's Theater. And so it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you the guy who taught me how to get up and uh, visualize and speak before public, the man who really has a new perspective on this iconic story in our history, Tom Bogar. I have to say my entire life. <laughs> my whole life I've been such a strong believer in the value of speech and theater education for young people. And I, I have to say, that one of the most rewarding things now that I've retired is seeing the product of all of that. And I have to say, here's a man who is a walking example of the value of what speech and drama education can do for you. I can handle this. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is... <laughs> I, I always try, whenever I'm talking, either at a larger venue or bookstores or anywhere, to get a sense of what my audience is. And uh, I spoke last month for the Lincoln Group in New York and the Surratt Conference, uh, Surratt Society Conference. These are people who know every arcane detail about the Lincoln assassination and are real scholars of it. And on the other end of the spectrum, I was 
doing research in a city that shall remain nameless, and I had dinner one night at a really nice upscale restaurant, and the manager of the restaurant came over to the table checking on everyone, and she asked what had brought me to her city. And I said, well, I'm researching the Lincoln assassination. And she looked at me with a blank look for a minute, and she said, Lincoln was assassinated? <laughs> so these are the two ends of the spectrum, but I'm going to talk this morning as if you're on the earlier end of that spectrum more than, than the latter end of it. And the funny thing too, Kumar hit on a really interesting note. I think invariably, whenever I'm doing radio interviews or, or interviews anywhere, invariably the first question that people ask is, well, there's 100, 120, 150 books out about the Lincoln assassination. Why is yours different? And what people forget, and, and my background is theater history, so I think what people forget is that this did really take place in a live theater in front of a live audience during a live production committed by an actor. And every other book, when you think about the Lincoln assassination right now, visualizing it as you mentioned, you're sitting in the audience. You're looking up to the stage. Uh, what I've done is spin it around. What would it have felt like to be backstage that night performing in that pre-electric light era when it's dark backstage and sound counts for so much more than sight, uh, the actor training is different. I really want the, the readers to feel like th what it was like spinning it around 180 degrees and looking at it from backstage. And I started work on this book actually. Um, sometimes I do PowerPoint, sometimes I have my larger pictures I'll try to use. Um, when I was working on my previous book on American presidents attend the theater, I came across this iconic playbill for our American cousin. And everybody looks at this and everybody knows it and it's, it's seen everywhere. And yet I kept focusing on the list of names down there, thinking, who are these people? Certainly somebody somewhere has written a book about the actors, and they hadn't. I went down to the Library of Congress and I started looking through book after book after book. And you know, every single book that I would find about the Lincoln assassination either follows John Wilkes Booth out the back door to his death in that burning tobacco barn at the Garrett Farm, which now is nothing but a median strip in the highway down there in Virginia, or it follows the mortally wounded president carried out the front door to his death in the Peterson House across the street, and nobody seemed to care about these actors. They're trapped inside. The soldiers are marching in, stacking up arms, telling them they can't leave. They're terrified. The audience is shrieking and, and climbing up over the abandoned orchestra uh, instruments, up onto the stage. The mob in the street is chanting, burn the damn place down, because they're angry about all of that. And the actors are trapped inside. These 46 actors and managers and stagehands are trapped inside and terrified. And for the rest of their lives, it ends up affecting their career, their life. Many of them are arrested, interrogated. Uh, the Ford brothers were held for th over a month, with never charged, in prison, repeatedly interrogated. Uh, in fact, the record of their interrogation at archives is just hundreds of pages in that terrible 19th century handwriting that I had to decipher. But the records are there. And for all of these people, it ended up, uh, as I say in the book, headlining their obituary. That was the thing that marked their life. And it was not pretty what happened to most of them. Uh, their careers after that were tainted. And in most cases, it was something that um, they had to deal with, either in a way of giving interviews or never talking about it. And I think one of the best quotes that I found, John Matthews, one of the actors, said, you know, in the days following the assassination, those who were the wisest knew the least. So, in other words, you kept a low profile, you didn't talk about it, you pretended you didn't know anything about it. And as I was, I figured I needed to tell the, the story of these people, I kept running into roadblocks. The first thing that I found is that even identifying who the 46 were was pretty tough. Their names changed because theater was looked down on in the 19th century to be an actor, especially an actress was looked on really as, as a pretty low-class profession. They were itinerant, uh, they were looked on as, as, as not really able to associate with respectable society, and so they dropped their surnames. A number of the actresses dropped their surnames so they wouldn't bring shame to their family and only acted by their first and their middle name, or they made up another name. Or they
they moved around a lot. The census records are tricky because you never know what city the actor is going to be in when the census is taken. Uh, and their birth dates change. I found this remarkable thing that the actresses, for every 10 years that they aged, they moved their birth date up five years. <laughs> so they could continue to act for any number of years playing younger and younger roles. Another thing, the stage crew. In today's program, we go to the theater, we open the program, and there's the names of all the crew. Not so in the 19th century. So I had to go into the interrogation testimony at archives to read who the people were, who the various stagehands were. I also had to weed out false claimants for every person who was really there that night. And I, I, have able, I finally was able to pinpoint every person, what they were doing, where they were standing at the moment of the shot backstage. But for every one of them, there were two or three false claimants. People who would say, you'd read their obituary in 1910, 1920, 1930. Oh, they were acting on the stage of Ford's Theater the night of the Lincoln assassination. But they weren't. Uh, there's a drama critic who wrote in 1916, it's estimated that enough people are credited with acting on the stage of Ford's Theater the night of April 14th, 1865, to have filled the playhouse itself. <laughs> so, uh, the beautiful thing is any of us who are researching and writing today have such wonderful digital search engines we can use. You can go down to the Library of Congress now and search by name, by word, virtually any newspaper that's ever been published in the US or the UK to find these people's names. Some of them, one girl backstage was 14 years old and newly married to her 42-year-old husband. Um, she was helping with makeup and she gave an interview in a North Dakota newspaper, South Dakota newspaper uh, in about 1890, Huron, South Dakota. I never would have found that interview talking about the assassination if I hadn't had it pop up on the screen. And, and now it's wonderful. It not only pops up on the screen. You remember the old microfilm readers we used to have to use? Now you bring it up electronically. You electronically mark the article and pop it onto your flash drive and take it home. It, it's amazing. The same thing with National Archives. Uh, all military records have now been digitized all the way back to the Revolutionary War. So I could enter the names of each of these people into the archives and find what regiment they fought with. And I was stunned. I remember sitting there one day, absolutely stunned, to think that working together backstage, rehearsing these plays and performing them every night during the Civil War were Union and Confederate veterans working side by side. One man had a son who died fighting for the Union. Another one had a brother who died fighting for the Confederacy. And so this whole place backstage at Ford's Theater was just a tinderbox waiting to explode. Another thing remarkable is that most of them were based in Baltimore. And if you know your history, you know that Baltimore was a hotbed of secessionist thought. There's a whole swath of Maryland going down to the eastern shore that really is pretty secessionist. Uh, and during the Civil War, it, it wasn't really, Maryland wasn't much of a border state, really. There was a lot of secessionist thought. So much of the sentiment backstage was kind of a hotbed of secessionist thought. Uh, it's remarkable that, that no one knew uh, or that President Lincoln didn't have some idea of what he was walking into. And yet he went because, despite it being Good Friday, traditionally a poor theater attendance night, it was Laura Keene's benefit night. And he had seen Laura Keene act before. He loved her performances. And he went because he knew that his presence there would boost the box office and she would get more money on her benefit night. So he went for that, and he loved our American country. He loved that kind of folksy humor. Uh, I found when I was researching the American President's uh, Theater book, their theatrical attendance, that Lincoln loved minstrel shows, and he loved that folksy Yankee humor, despite also loving Shakespeare. His favorite Shakespearean tragedy was Macbeth. And in Act Five of Macbeth, there is a wonderful quote, life is but a walking shadow a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. And I thought, that's what these people are. They're walking shadows, these players. They did their part and then they're heard no more. And I had this genius idea. I thought I was going to call the book Walking Shadows. I thought that's really what they are, a quote from Macbeth. It's got some eclat to it. So I sent it into the publisher with the title Walking Shadows. And the history buyer for Barnes & Noble said to me, that sounds like another vampire book. <laughs> so 
the history buyer for Barnes & Noble said, you know, you ought to call this backstage of the Lincoln assassination because today people search for books online by certain key terms. And when the history buyer for Barnes & Noble suggests a title to your book, you really take it very seriously. <laughs> and, and it has done very well. And I, th I think in the long run, despite my love for the quote, uh, it really is, has been a, a better title for it. Um, I think one thing that I wanted to establish, too, for the reader is to get a sense of the chronology of that day. Um, I include the plot of Our American Cousin, because most people don't know the story. Um, I've seen a performance of it. It still plays pretty well. It's hokey, uh, but it's a funny comedy. And almost everybody, when they gave an interview, whether it would be 1870s, 1880s, I'd find these different interviews and letters. I went up to the Harvard Theater Collection, and there were just tons of letters that these actors had written to each other that nobody had ever requested. They were just gathering dust because nobody had come at it from this angle. And the actors would always say, well, I was doing thus and such during the Dairy Maid scene, or someone else came on during Act Two, Scene Three. So I knew that everything was keyed into the script of Our American Cousin. So I thought, simple matter, I'll just find the script. There's about nine different versions of the script of Our American Cousin. So I had to find at Library of Congress the actual 1865 script. I read it out loud and timed every five minutes, pausing for laughs, what would have been happening. Um, and the odd thing I found is whenever intermission hit, almost every one of the actors said, oh, we went and had a drink. So there was a saloon on the south side of Ford's Theater and a saloon on the north side. The saloon on the south side was where all the secessionists went to drink. The saloon on the north side is where the <laughs> unionists went to drink. <laughs> it was that divided. And you know what I found? that. In the course of the afternoon and evening, John Wilkes Booth had seven or eight drinks, good stiff shots, before he actually came in for the assassination, working up his courage. Uh, and the remarkable thing, too, is that how many other people went and had a drink with him? And you would do that, too. You know, you're at work. It's a normal work day, a beautiful April day. Uh, the war is over. You're happy. The audience is coming in tonight. Your friend John Wilkes Booth comes in. You have a drink with him. Who would have thought? Uh, the amazing thing to me is as open as he was about his secessionist thought, why no one ratted him out. And I think it was because he was so charismatic. He would come backstage and everyone just flocked to him. This one actress said, when we acted with him, we were like sunflowers turning our face toward the sun when he came in the room. Uh, he was that charismatic and that athletic. Um, he would make his entrance as Macbeth leaping from eight feet down to the stage. And you know the distance from the lip of the Lincoln box to the stage floor is 11 feet 6 inches. That's quite a leap. And he put his hands on the edge and vaulted like a gymnast, but the stage floor is sloping. In those days, the audience sat flat, and the stage sloped upwards. So if you were going upstage, you were really going upstage. And he landed off balance, caught his spur. Uh, the stage manager's wife I found a wonderful statement she gave when she said that John Wilkes Booth was hopping like a mad bullfrog across the stage. I love that image. Um, the stage manager's wife was in the fourth row, and she's one of the few people who stayed in the theater that night with her husband. It was a scary place to be with the mob continuing to be out in the street. Um, I wanted to also give you a real quick sense of who some of these key figures were. Um, most people don't even know the names. Um, and the Brady studio took some pictures in a reenactment, pulled them all back together again a week after the assassination, made them reenact the play, pausing at certain moments to measure how much wing space would have been free to let Booth escape. Imagine playing a comedy out into an audience of detectives and, and military men, not even smiling at all, who then have to make you freeze every few minutes. Most people uh, don't know or have never seen a picture of John Ford, a wonderfully benevolent man, acting mayor of Baltimore, um, owner of the theater. He was out of town that night. He was down in Richmond. He was seeing to family business. But despite that, not even being there that night, he's arrested. He's held in Old Capitol Prison, which ironically stood where the US Supreme Court stands today, just across the street from the Capitol. And he left in charge his 21-year-old brother, Harry Ford. Imagine being 21, 21 years old, and you're in charge of the theater that night. Harry Ford 
is arrested and interrogated. He's released three times. His testimony fills over 30 pages down at archives. And then there is Laura Keene. I have a special feeling for Laura Keene. This picture, which appears in the book, has never been published anywhere. She's actually wearing the gray moray silk dress that she wore in Act Three, which is the dress that was bloodied uh, when she went up to the box. She actually went through a circuitous route backstage up through the building next door and down into the box to cradle the head of the dying president uh, and got blood all over her, most of which was from Rathbone, Colonel Rathbone, who's with Lincoln, uh, whom Booth slashed. But Laura Keene, from that point on, was identified with the assassination. She had been, in the 1850s, early 1860s, one of the most respected theater manager actresses in America in what had been a man's world. She was a highly successful woman in that world, and yet from the moment of the assassination on, her career is a trajectory downward. In the North, they associated with the assassination. The South, they think she's still a Yankee. Uh, she contracts tuberculosis, and she's dead within eight years. In so many cases, their lives afterwards take a turn for the worst. She's touring with John Dyatt. He's an older actor, tragedian. Uh, he was in the play that night and never spoke of the event. He wouldn't grant interviews, made no mention of it in his obituary. Uh, when he died, no actors attended his funeral at all. He kind of disappears. Harry Hawk was the lone man left on stage the, when the moment of the shot. Harry Hawk delivered that famous line, the biggest laugh in the show, you sockdologizing old man trap. And that's the laugh that was the biggest laugh in the show. And Booth figured, having acted in Our American Cousin himself 12 times, knew that the sound of the laughter would probably cover the sound of the gunshot. Um, he did it a little bit early, and Harry Hawk maintained to the end of his life that he never finished the actual line. But Harry Hawk, the minute that Booth leaps down on stage, runs off stage. And what people didn't know until I found an interview in the 1880s is that Harry Hawk had been seeing one of John Wilkes Booth's fancy women uh, that same week. And Booth had said to Harry Hawk, if I ever catch you with her again, I'll kill you. So when John Wilkes Booth leaps down from the stage with this 12 inch Bowie knife in his hand, Harry Hawk thinks he's coming to kill him, and he runs off the stage. And he said in the interview, I did what any man would have, do, would have done. I ran off the stage. Uh, and there are any number of, of, of the other actors, too. John Matthews is another one uh, who is a close friend of, of Booth's. In fact, uh, Matthews was constantly being recruited by Booth and wouldn't be drawn into his program of, of the assassination. Booth actually failed to tell the others that it had turned from an abduction into an assassination. But one month before the assassination, John Matthews had rented the very room in the Peterson House across the street in which Lincoln would die. And his actor friends, Ned um, Emerson, John McCullough, and John Wilkes Booth came and hung out with him in that room. And Booth even laid down on the bed, smoked a pipe, and took a nap on the very bed that Abraham Lincoln would die on a month later. There's so many strange coincidences connected with all of this. Uh, and the stories just l jumped out at me, needing to be told. Uh, and I found myself, more than anything else, becoming obsessed with telling their story. And along the way, I came across this wonderful quote by film director Martin Scorsese. Scorsese says that when you're creating any work of art, your job is to make your audience care about your obsessions. And so I thank you for caring about my obsession, these 46 walking shadows. Thank you. I don't know if I have time for a quick question. If I do, uh, also, I'll be around all day today. I'm going to be over the signing tent right after this. And I'm gonna, I've come to this as an attendee for years. And I, I love this festival. And so it, it feels like coming home to be here. Are there any questions that I can deal with quickly? How long did it take you to do all that? Eight years. <laughs> I was. I was teaching and directing full time, but two years ago I retired so I could finish this up uh, and go through the getting an agent and, and getting the publisher process. The letters, the letters that were gathering dust, uh, where did you find them? 
Uh, the question was about the letters that are gathering, we're gathering dust. There is a wonderful, wonderful place called the Harvard Theater Collection. It is mecca for theater historians. It's the pictures and the letters of all of the actors that have ever been. Uh, the shame is that their staff has gotten cut back. It used to be about 15 people, now it's down to about three. But there is just a treasure trove. You know, you give them a name and they'll bring out this box that is letters of Laura Keene or the letters of Harry Hawk. And for Harvard Theater, Harvard Theater Collection, it's part of the Houghton Library on the Harvard campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, the publisher Regner History has, has been wonderful, uh, but Barnes & Noble has been uh, wonderful too in terms of uh, getting me around to do book talks at stores uh, and giving a nice shelf promotion. So that's, that's been nice. The, the publisher Regner History uh, actually has been the one that handles the distribution and the Oh, it, they were, it was a suggestion that, in other words, if his, they have to decide who's going to buy which books, and they decide that they, they, would, they would buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was, what happened to Booth's brothers' careers? Edwin Booth, out of shame, uh, quit the stage immediately. And yet January 3rd, 1866, almost a year later, he schedules a return to the stage as Hamlet at the Winter Garden Theater in New York. Uh, and the, they're so afraid there's going to be a riot because this brother of an assassin dares to come back to the stage that he actually, they had police stationed there. Um, and John Diet, who was the tragedian with Laura Keene that night, he was playing Polonius and he got to stand there and see the tears of gratitude running down Edwin Booth's face at the reception of the audience. They loved him. He went on tour after that. In fact, he was on tour down south in Mobile, Alabama, and a man came up to him, Boston Corbett, and he said, you know, Mr. Booth, I know that you're going to give me complimentary tickets to your show when you learn that I'm the man who killed your brother. And Edwin Booth did give him complimentary tickets to the show, to his credit. So he did tour very successfully, but the day of Edwin Booth's funeral in 1893, the funeral in New York, Ford's Theater collapsed to the ground, killing 26 clerks. That's a great question. The question was, are there things as I trace the chronology of the night that didn't make sense to me? Um, I made them make sense. I tried to figure out what the context was, why somebody would have been somewhere. Um, the thing that was difficult was why so many people were uh, backstage in the, in the green room. And I think it was they were preparing for what was going to be a big uh, song presented afterwards that uh, the conductor Withers had written. They didn't seem to be where they should have been backstage. In fact, John Matthews uh, was seen coming in in street clothes, and I still can't explain that. I think he knew more than he ever admitted why he would have been out of costume right before the assassination. Where had he been? So there are some questions still of who was involved and, and how much. And I also can't figure out were there spies backstage, but that's in the book. Thank you.